Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. We have breaking news as we go on the air tonight about the fatal shooting on the set of the Alec Baldwin movie, Rust. The Santa Fe district attorney has just said she is not, not ruling out the possibility of criminal charges. In an interview with the New York Times tonight, District Attorney Mary Carmack Altwees offered a number of new bombshell details. She told the Times that it was not a prop gun that was used. Quote, it was a legit gun. She described it as an antique era appropriate gun. The DA also said that there were, quote, an enormous amount of bullets on this set, and we need to find out what kinds they were. Now, we're expecting a press conference from her tomorrow. But before we go any further, I want to bring in Clay Van Sickle. He's an expert who's overseen firearm safety on a host of different productions, worked as an armorer on dozens of feature films. Thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. Appreciate it. All right. I want to start with this breaking news. How significant is it to you that this was a, a real gun, according to the DA, that was used? Uh, that would be insignificant. Uh the problem is the term prop is being used and everybody assumes that means it's fake. It's not a real gun. A prop is anything an actor interacts with on camera. So that could be a real gun, a rubber gun, a replica gun, a blank fire only gun. So it doesn't surprise me at all that it was a real gun because we use those all the time with blanks and all the appropriate safety protocols. Well, what, what about the fact that she made this comment about um, that there were an enormous amount of bullets on this set? I mean, what the heck are a ton of bullets doing on the set? Yeah, so if, she, if she's talking about bullets, meaning live ammunition, live lethal ammunition with projectile in them, that concerns me a lot. There should not normally ever be live am, ammunition on set. Um, she says that the d detectives recovered three revolvers, spent casings, and ammunition in boxes, loose, and in a fanny pack while executing a search warrant on the set. Again, I say to you, significance of that. The fact that there's so much loose ammo laying around concerns me a bit. Generally, we keep those in clearly labeled boxes because we have different load sizes for our blanks. And also, if you're keeping dummy rounds, which look like real bullets but are not, on set, you want to keep those concise, clearly labeled so everybody knows exactly what they are. So to be clear, to you, it is far less significant that they were using a real gun, right? Because your point is that what they're using isn't the significant point. The more significant thing for you is the fact that there appears to be ammunition and bullets, quote, all over that set. Correct, yeah. The real guns are used all the time. Most of the guns you see on camera in nearly every show are real guns firing blanks. But the fact that there could have been live ammunition on a set is absolutely taboo and does not happen on a normal set. All right, stand by for a sec, because the more we're learning, the more trouble it could spell for Alec Baldwin as a producer on the film. Late yesterday, Hollywood trade blog The Wrap reported that the gun that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins was used on the morning of the shooting for live ammunition target practice. They reported that several members of the crew took prop guns from the set and shot live rounds at beer cans known as plinking. But we now know that the gun that was used, as we just said, was a real one, an antique one. Now, there were other red flags before filming even started. Black, uh, Clay. Uh, Clay, um, I, I want to ask you, if you can, to demonstrate for us, because one of the, the big questions in this case has been, could they have known, should they have known that there was a live round in the weapon? Talk to us about what you do to ensure, as someone on this set, that this actually is a cold gun. Sure. The basic protocol, every time I pick up a weapon, no matter where it is, I always clear it. I ensure that it's empty and there are no rounds in it. If I'm bringing that onto the set, the first stop is the first AD. The first assistant director is the primary safety officer on the set. I will allow them to visually inspect the weapon so they know it's cold and empty. At that point, they will call it out to the crew. They will call it out on the radio that there's a cold gun on set. At that time, any member of the crew or the cast they would like to look at that gun and confirm for themselves that it's empty, could do so. Once that's all done, then I walk over to the actor. I confirm with them that it's cold. Once that's done, I double check with camera and any other crew members that may be in the area. And once that's all done, then I can hand it off to the actor. 
All right, Only next play, can you show, do you have, I believe you have a weapon with you, is that correct? If you could yes. show me, yeah, if you could show me the process by which you would go through uh, to, to do exactly what you were talking about. Sure, with a single action revolver like this, you open the cylinder and rotate through all six cylinders so you can clearly see that they are empty and that there is no brass inside there. And it literally takes that long. And, and let me ask you, now that we know that this was an antique gun, um, would you expect that the same sort of thing you just showed us would be, uh, it would be the same process? It should be exactly the same. The, this is a modern reproduction of the antique guns of that period. So the action would have been exactly the same. All right, I want to ask you about this assistant uh, director. His name is Dave Halls, um, and he apparently was the person who yelled cold gun. He was the one who apparently gave the weapon to Alec Baldwin. Um, is that unusual? Extremely. Uh, there should never be a case where an AD touches a weapon. There should be an uninterrupted chain of custody from the armorer straight to the talent and back. At a certain point, the AD, of course, needs to visually inspect, but they should not have hands on a gun for any reason, nor should they be calling a gun cold that they have not actually inspected themselves. Right, and, and, I, would, and I would think that, that this is the exact reason that you don't want that person doing it, right? Because the question now is, did that person actually examine the weapon at all? Precisely. If that chain of custody breaks, now you introduce the possibility of problems. So as long as the armor controls everything from the beginning to the end, there's only one person to go back to. Right. And again, we are continuing to cover this now as a breaking news story because the district attorney there in Santa Fe has indicated that criminal charges are now on the table um, and that there were an enormous number of bullets on the set. We need to find out what kinds they were. And you heard Clay telling us right there that he does not understand why there would have been bullets, plural, on that set. Let's do this. Clay, can you stay, if you can stick around uh, for a minute. Um, we we want to um, bring in Ashley Banfield. Is Ashley ready yet? Because, okay. So let's do this. Let's take a break. We'll come right back with Clay and Ashley Banfield on this breaking news. We're getting more in now on the Santa Fe District Attorney and the investigation into the shooting of Helena Hutchins. Coming right back. We are back with this breaking news in the investigation out of Santa Fe, New Mexico, into the shooting of Helena Hutchins by actor Alec Baldwin on the shooting of Rust. And this from the District Attorney tonight, telling the New York Times, we have not ruled out anything. Everything at this point, including criminal charges, is on the table. And one of the most important points that she made in this interview uh, that our guest really felt was significant, Clay Van Sickle, was that she said there, was, there were an enormous amount of bullets on this set, and we need to find out what kinds they were. Detectives said they recovered three revolvers, spent casings and ammunition in boxes, loose and in a fanny pack, while executing a search warrant on the set. She also said that it was an antique era appropriate gun. It was a legit gun, um, not what some are referring to as a, quote, prop gun. Before we go back to Clay Van Sickle to talk about some of the details around this, I want to bring in Ashley Banfield uh, joining us now to talk about these breaking developments. Of course, Ashley is the host of Banfield and has been all over this story since it broke. Um, Ashley, let me just first get your response to this news from the DA in Santa Fe. So I am not the least bit surprised, Dan, and you as a lawyer probably are not either because there is a woman dead and that shouldn't happen on a film set. And a man named Alec Baldwin shouldn't be handed a gun that's called cold only to have a dead woman and an injured director result. So I am not the least bit surprised given the fact I have seen a director go to jail in the past for unsafe working conditions that killed an actor or at least a crew member on a movie set before. What I think is 
as fascinating as the language the DA has been using when they say a number of bullets, I kept thinking, surely that DA means casings because there could be all sorts of casings all over the set, right? If they're firing off blanks left, right, and center on a Western, there should be casings Ooh. everywhere. But that she used, or you know, the, the DA used the term well, bullets makes me very concerned. Right, and Ashley, then she later, according to the Times, distinguished between casings and ammunition. So it's not as if she doesn't know the difference, right? I mean, there are some people yeah. who have never fired weapons who don't know the difference between a casing and a bullet. But she said, detectives said they recovered, um, uh, well, this is actually from the Times, I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the t according to the Times, detectives said they recovered three revolvers, spent casings, and ammunition. She used the word bullets separately. But you're absolutely right that that, to me, is the, the biggest point here. Let me bring in back in Clay Van Sickle here. Uh, Clay, talk to us about the difference, and I think you have something to show us there, between a dummy round, a blank, and a live round. Sure. They're very easily distinguishable between each other. This is a blank. You can see the front end where the bullet would be on a real round is crimped. So when that fires, it'll open up like a flower and release all the gas. That gives you the flash and the smoke that we like to see on camera. This is a dummy round, which looks like a real round in all respects, except in the rear where the primer is punched. Inside, there's also a small BB. I don't know, don't know if you can hear that or not, but so that we can easily tell that that's not a real round. Finally, this is a real round. Unpunched primer, obviously full of powder, and it's got a re real bullet on the end. So that is the concerning part, is when the DA talks about a bullet, the bullet is actually the projectile only. The entire thing is the cartridge. So if she's referring to a cartridge with bullets on it, that is a huge red flag for a film set. And Ashley Banfield, as you know, um, a website, The Wrap, reporting that <clears throat> there were people who were using the weapon, according to them, to shoot beer cans using live rounds. Now, the DA now saying that is, quote, unconfirmed, but that is certainly something that they have to look into because there is no reason that people would ever or should ever be using a real weapon with real bullets on the set in breaks and then just bringing it back onto set. Yeah, they're props, but they're real. And what your guest just said is spot on. Uh, these real guns are on the set everywhere. It's just that you don't put the bullet in the casing. So you have the, the recoil, the effect of it, Dan. But my goodness, if people were out there plinking as they call it. Plinking is taking a gun and just going out and firing it off on beer cans and having some fun on breaks, maybe, you know, in the, in the uh, New Mexico desert. If they were out doing that, where were the grown-ups? Where were those people whose job it is to say, excuse me, that is a real weapon, those are real bullets, you're fired, get off this set. That is a lethal hazard. We don't allow lethal hazards in our workplace, Dan. I can't whip out a gun because it looks good on the set and, and have nobody actually say something about it. Where were right. the grown-ups? And I think that is where you're seeing uh, the DA looking at who is culpable for this. And Clay Van Sickle, you agree, right? The notion that in breaks, if it's true, that there were people sort of using this weapon, which we now know was a real gun, um, to shoot beer cans, et cetera, that that's a real problem. If, if that's true, that's insanity. That is unconscionable and should not ever happen. What you do on your own time is one thing, but once a weapon is on a show, it's sequestered and that's all it does until the end of that show and it's done. Right, and that's critical, right? Do you used to use the word sequestered meaning you treat this thing with great care. Everyone who touches it has to be incredibly careful for this exact reason, because you're dealing, as Ashley just pointed out, with real weapons. And for whatever reason, in this case, there was a real bullet, which never should have been there. So I will just tell you, as we conclude this piece of this segment, that everything we are learning, every detail we have now learned in this breaking news is more bad news legally because the more negligence that is demonstrated on the set, the more issues that are raised about the safety and protocols on that set, 
the more potential legal problems we are talking about. And remember, we're talking about the possibility of directors, producers. Alec Baldwin was a producer on this film, and that is where I think his greatest potential legal liability could lie. Clay Van Sickle, thank you so much for sharing your expertise on this. Really appreciate it. And Ashley Banfield, please don't go anywhere because we want to get your take on this next one. We now know how police lost track of Brian Laundry. They thought his mom was him. But Roberta and Brian Laundry do not really look alike. This and other breaking news in that investigation coming up. A chapter in this investigation still being written. I still have questions. At the top of my list, of course, is how in the world did the Northport Police Department mistake his mom for Brian? Ashley Banfield is still with us. All right, Ashley, that seems to be question one, right? Which is how could they possibly have mistaken Brian Laundry for his mother? For me, it's question 51. I mean, what was the quote? They're built similarly. She's in her late 50s, early 60s, and Brian's a dude with a beard. I am <laughs> so unclear about them being built similarly. She wears flouncy tops and tights. Uh, Brian doesn't. That is just no, I, I can't even enumerate how many times I have seen Keystone Cuppage coming out of the Northport Police. And I think the first episode of it, Dan, happened two days beforehand. Because when Brian backed the Mustang out of the driveway, there was a live camera streaming from across the street, capturing every minute of what the laundries were up to. Because the police put it there. So somebody was having a nap or going for coffee or doing something instead of watching the live stream when Brian backed out of the driveway and drove himself to his grave site. Yeah. Um, Ashley, I want to ask you about something that you had on your show last night. You had a terrific show, and you had a great guest who was answering this question that we've all been asking about sort of what happens now that the autopsy report is inconclusive. What do they do with the bones? Let me play a piece of sound from your show last night. Is there a chance that we will never find out um, how Brian Laundrie died? Absolutely. There are a, one of the things that the anthropologists will look at is manner of death. They will look for any evidence of sharp instrument trauma. And I'm only talking hypothetically because I didn't work on this case, but uh, mm -hmm. I've worked on many similar to it. But they will be looking for sharp instrument trauma stabbing, slashing. They will be looking for blunt instrument trauma. They will be looking, of course, for gunshot trauma. And those, of course, are going to give you some information about manner of death. There are many types of death that don't leave anything in the bones. So, Ashley, did she give you a sense of how long this might take? You know, it usually doesn't take too long. If you think about Gabby Petito, um, they had an anthropologist and an entomologist looking at Gabby's remains as well, although I suspect, and not to get too into the, the weeds because it is uncomfortable discussion, that there was some tissue that they were able to determine um, on Gabby's remains because they were able to determine that she was strangled. You can't tell that from bones. You can tell that oftentimes from tissue. But the thing that I was interested in is they're not going to find a, a gunshot because if he shot himself to death, the gun doesn't walk away it's kind of close by if he hanged himself well then the noose would be still around the the spinal column uh if he poisoned himself with a drug or a poison of some kind that's the secret uh that doesn't go into the bones or the or the connective cartilage that sort of thing that you can't tell from a skeleton so they'll look at everything they can they'll look for those tool marks they can even tell if he cut his wrists at times not always um but they will be able to to do their job and no more than that Let's play a piece of sound. This is from Brian Enton's interview with the Northport Police Department's public information officer, Josh Taylor. Our intention was to keep an eye on Brian. And clearly him uh, going out there, uh, we missed him going out there. So he left in the Mustang and no one knew that he left in the Mustang? That's correct. I mean, isn't it? I mean, we've been outside the house. I mean, it, was there just no one sitting outside the house watching? I mean someone like fall asleep yeah. I mean how do you it's not like you snuck out the back if you left out in the front in the yeah. Mustang well again he, he wasn't wanted yeah there's certain things you can do with surveillance and intelligence 
when you're at a certain point in an investigation, when there are certain charges, where there's these types of things. Yeah, but yeah, there, no. was a, there, there was a reason <laughs> yeah, that no. the next, there was a reason <laughs> that on September 16th, they were assuring the public that they knew where Brian Laundry was. Why? Because yeah. everyone knew at that point that he was not just a suspect, he was the suspect. And so, you know, yes, there are rules that, that apply before an arrest warrant, after an arrest warrant, et cetera, but that doesn't change whether you can make sure you're keeping an eye on someone who you are expecting at any moment is either going to have an arrest warrant or might flee. That's the problem. Mm. Yeah, and I think I heard Mr. Taylor on uh, a CNN special a week and a half ago saying, what are we supposed to do? A guy goes for a walk in the woods, follow him? To my answer, I threw a peanut at the TV screen and said, yes, that is what you do when you may not have an official piece of probable cause in your hand, but you've got a missing woman, you've got a man who has her van, and you have a family that will not speak to the police. Yes, you follow him to see where he is going. And and by the way, Dan, um, then if, if what Mr. Taylor just said in that soundbite to Brian Enton is true, there's only certain things you can do, then why'd you put the camera on the neighbor's lawn across the street? Why did you establish a 24-7 streaming signal to have surveillance and eyes on that house? And then you just didn't bother with the actual work product from it. That's my big question. Yeah. All right, well, the good news is that we're, we can always get answers. I know I can get my answers by watching Banfield at 10 o'clock right here on <laughs> News Nation. Ashley will always have the big story. So she'll certainly be covering the Alec Baldwin uh, case tonight as well. Yes, and Ashley. Dan, real quickly, we also yeah, have please. Sharon Waxman from The Wrap who broke that story about the plinking, people taking the guns off set and having a little fun uh, during the breaks. Yeah. She's going to join us but let's more be on that. Let, let, let's be careful with that story because the, the DA is specifically saying in the Times article that that quote is unconfirmed, which makes me think they may not believe it. But we shall see. Possibly. Ashley, thank you. Yep, you bet. All right, thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. Nobody's going to kill you, all right? Nobody's going to... Nothing like that's going to happen. A woman wielding a pickaxe and a bat taunting officers to shoot her. The whole thing caught on police body cam. That's coming up. Time for our police cam segment showing the dangers officers face every day. We're about to see what happened when a woman in Nashville, Tennessee, threatened police officers with a baseball bat and a pickaxe. First, here's a portion of some of the 911 call. She said she wanted, to, she wanted to harm herself, uh, wanted the police or SWAT to come out and hopefully they would shoot her. But we try to keep her calm and, and tell her don't, not to do that. Police arrived on scene, uh, tried to get Melissa Wooden to put the weapons down. Officer Ben Williams tried to defuse the situation. Go ahead and kill me. Nobody's going to kill you, Melissa. Step away from my car. Me all want. I'm trying you to get her away from my phone. This is going to be handed off. Okay, Melissa. Please. Nobody is going to kill you. No one is going to harm you. You know how this ends? Okay? We're not doing this. Do not talk to me. Go ahead and be I already all this today. Okay. Y'all can taser me, go ahead and taser me, and I'll fucking go up and kill me at this point. Melissa, come on. I'm being serious. I know, but let's just set it down and talk. Let's at least go that route. Now, the talks went on for nearly six minutes as police tried to bring the situation to a peaceful resolution, but things seemed to take a turn when Wooden's mother arrived, threatening her daughter and saying she needed to go to the hospital. Officers told the mom not to get too close to her daughter because the officers would be responsible if she was hurt. Whoa, 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 whoa. Easy, ma'am, back, ma back, back away from her. Don't do back that. Away from her. Back away from her. Back away from her. You, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the key out of this thing, this okay? That, ma'am, just please. Negative, we're working on it. Back up. Just, 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 you're going back to the hospital. Just stay away from the street. I'm backing up. Taser, taser, taser. 
Come get him. Shots fired. As she went to swing the weapons, Officer Williams deployed his taser, but another officer opened fire. Wooden was taken to the hospital and recovered. Here to guide us through what just happened is Sean Sticks Larkin, retired lieutenant with the Tulsa Police Department, my, for the, my former live PD compadre. Uh, Sticks, thanks for coming back. This is an unsettling, unsettling situation, tough video to watch there. Um, what are the, some of the things that the officers needed to come to keep in mind when dealing with a situation like this one? Uh, you know, this term for somebody who's talking about hurting themselves or even the suicide by cop, which is a common term, uh, you know, in law enforcement, we're calling it personal violence now, and it's not a crime. So law enforcement as a whole across the country has kind of changed the way we handle some of these calls. Obviously, we have more, you know, mental health response officers. We're using outside sources that can come out and work with us as well. But some of these incidents where a person is in the house by themselves, no other people uh, have the potential to be harmed, if they don't want our help, we're actually even leaving the scene because we don't want to force something to happen. There have been lawsuits where people are accusing law enforcement of forcing something to happen. Very different than what we're watching here though. Uh, the officers actually had very, very good rapport uh, with the young woman. Things were going quite well. She was not agitated. She was engaging in conversation. And then the mother showed up, which drastically changed things very quickly. Yeah, and, and you've often told me when we look at scenes that are happening that one of the great dangers in any kind of scene like this or anything remotely like this is other people, meaning other people coming in. They, they, they take away from the officer's ability to focus on the particular person that they're trying to deal with. Yeah, and that's exactly it. They, they, you know, they're interfering with what's going on. Like I said, in this situation, you've got good rapport between the officer who's talking to her. He's trying to let her know, hey, we're not going to hurt you. We're not going to kill you. You know, we're not going to grant you what you're saying you wish. But another uh, issue is, besides a distracting distraction, is the mother. She literally places herself in danger. She puts herself between the officer and the, uh, the lady with the weapons. So the officers themselves are forced now to get in front of the mother so that she's not a potential victim. And at one point in the video, you actually see the daughter raise uh, you know, that pickaxe up towards the mother, um, which the officer gets right in front of. Yeah. All right. Uh, Sean Larkin, thank you, as always, for coming on the show. This is uh, it's important perspective in uh, what was a situation it seems no one uh, wanted. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. We're staying on the topic of police because Minneapolis seeing a double-digit surge in violent crimes, but now Representative Elon Omar, who fought to defund the police, is actually placing the blame at the fleet of the officers, while now pushing to get the entire police department eliminated. That's coming up. I am not sure why I remain shocked by Minnesota Representative Elon Omar, but maybe it's because I am an eternal optimist. This time last year, the calls for defund the police were deafening. Cities across the country were discussing completely upending police departments in the wake of the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Chief among those calling to defund the police was Congresswoman Omar. And when you have an institution that has lost the trust of the people it's supposed to serve, then you have to make a big decision on what you do with that institution. And for so many of us, it is going through a process of dismantling that institution. What we are saying is the current infrastructure that exists as policing in our city um, should not exist anymore. Not only do we need to disinvest for in police, but we need to completely dismantle the Minneapolis Police Department. Well, last December, Omar and many other activists around the country got their wish when the Minneapolis City Council voted to slash nearly $8 million, or about 4.5% of the city's proposed policing budget. And next week, city residents will vote on whether or not to do away with the Minneapolis Police Department entirely, opting instead for a Department of Public Safety to be nominated by the mayor and for the city council to approve. The ballot initiative needs 51% of the vote to pass. Minnesota is in the midst of a violent crime wave. 
that may cause a reckoning between the state and its largest city over its approach to policing reform. According to the Minnesota Department of Public Safety's annual uniform crime report, Minnesota saw a 54% spike in arson, 62% increase in assaults on on-duty officers. The state also saw a record 185 murders last year, up 58% from 2019, and this year's number is on track to be even higher. The statewide crime spike is being felt in Minneapolis too. The city has already seen 78 homicides so far this year, but those numbers have not convinced Representative Omar of the obvious, that cutting police and their budgets is obviously bad for public safety. No, instead, she actually blamed the Minneapolis police officers for the crime in that city. We must also recognize is that the reduction in policing currently in our city and the lawlessness that is happening um, is due to two things. One, the police have chosen to not fulfill their oath of office and to provide the public safety they are owed to the citizens they serve, right? It's documented. But even before that, it was documented. The Minneapolis Police Department is the most dysfunctional police department in our state and probably in the country. Well, it's dysfunctional now because people like Congresswoman Omar treat the department and its officers with such disdain. She's demonized the police, leading to low morale and fear that any action on their part will lead to criticism or worse. Joining us now is Richard Stanek, the now retired sheriff of Hennepin County, one of the, it's the home of Minneapolis, actually. He was also the state's public safety commissioner, which oversees public safety in the state. He's currently the co-founder of Public Safety Strategies Group. Thanks very much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, so you know, what do you make of the comment from Representative Omar that it is basically the fault of the police officers for the increased crime wave in Minneapolis? Well, I mean, she said it. She basically said that uh, law enforcement's not fulfilling the oath of their job. But what we know for sure is that this abolish and defund movement is a failed experience. Experiment. You look at the last 12 to 18 months across this country and in Minneapolis where she lives, and you see violent crime is out of control. You talked about murder, 78 of them this year. That's up 114% from what is the 10-year uh, average. Or gunshot victims, 650 of them this year. I just listened about an hour and a half ago to four people shot in South Minneapolis, two of them juveniles. Crime is out of control. And, and you know, this this initiative that's being considered that the voters are going to vote on is one of the most confusing things that i've ever read and i know there's been a huge fight over this about exactly what the language was going to say and not say and there have been lawsuits and judges weighing it but this is the this is the actual words of what people are supposed to be voting on it reads shall the minneapolis city charter be amended to remove the police department and replace it with a Department of Public Safety. What does that department do? Well, that employs a comprehensive public health approach to the delivery of the functions by the Department of Public Safety. With those specific functions to be determined by the mayor and city council by ordinance, which will not be subject to exclusive mayoral power over its establishment, maintenance and command, and which could include which could include licensed peace officers, otherwise known as police officers, if necessary, to fulfill its responsibilities for public safety, with the general nature of the amendments being briefly indicated in the explanatory note below. I mean, look, this is, this is a mess, this particular, and, and it almost seems to me that it is so confusing at this point as to what they're actually saying what they're really saying is we want to get rid of the police department, but we know how unpopular that is. So we want to leave the possibility of potentially putting police officers back if we need to. You know, it's just purposely vague and misleading. I work with a group called FightForOurHeroes.com, which is educational about this ballot initiative. I mean, this vote is happening right now. The final vote, five days away. But if you look at this, 
And one thing it does do, it will remove the minimum number of staffing for peace officers in the city of Minneapolis, 1.7 per thousand. They are down two thirds of their normal staffing levels now, maybe lower. Response to 911 calls should be taking three minutes or less. Now they're taking 15 plus minutes. And the people who are suffering are the residents in the neighborhoods themselves. 85% of the people hit by gunfire are African Americans. They're the victims of the crimes. Well, you know, one of the things that I've always found to be such a bait and switch is this public health, right? This idea that we just need more people who are experts in, in uh, um, mental issues and people who are experts in psychology, et cetera, social workers to show up at the scene of people where that's the concern. The problem is when you get a call on 911 and they say someone is carrying a knife, you don't know these people very well may be um, having issues that are you know, real mental concerns. But anyway, I, I'm out of time. This thing really gets me so riled up. But Rich Stanek, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right, Facebook under fire. The cable news talking heads are all outraged, but it depends on where you watch to determine what to be outraged about. It's next.